You know, according to uh, Google, which I often go to for all of my resources, there are four basic types of questions. There is one, the rhetorical question, which is a question that's not really meant to be answered, but it's supposed to cause you to think a little bit. There are closed-ended questions, which are just yes or no questions. And then there are open-ended questions. Those are like the more subjective questions that you use in Bible talks. And then there's also loaded questions, questions that imply something just in asking it, such as, I bet you're really hungry right now, huh? <laughs> but today, we're going to be looking at some giant questions. Right. Let's turn our Bibles to 1 Samuel chapter 17. Come on, and we're going to be studying out the story of a giant and the story of a young boy named David. 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 1. And we're going to look at some of the questions that this giant asked. Starts off right here. And it says, Now the Philistines gathered their forces for war and assembled at Sukkah in Judah. They pitched camp at Ephes the men between Sukkah and Ezekah. Saul and the Israelites assembled and camped in the valley of Elah and drew up their battle line to meet the Philistines. The Philistines occupied one hill and the Israelites the other, with the valley between the both. A champion named Goliath, who was from Gath, came out of the Philistine camp. He was over nine feet tall. He had a bronze helmet in his head and wore a coat of scale armor of bronze weighing 5,000 shekels. On his legs, he wore bronze greaves, and on bronze javelin was strung, slung on his back. His spear shaft was like a weaver's rod, and its iron point weighed 600 shekels. His shield bearer went up ahead of him. Goliath stood and shouted to the ranks of Israel, Why do you come out to battle and line up? Right here, am I not a Philistine, and are you not the servants of Saul? Choose a man and have him come down to me. If he is able to fight and kill me, I will become your subject, And because if I overcome him and kill him, you will become our subjects and serve us. Then the Philistine said, This day I defy the ranks of Israel. Give me a man and let us fight each other. On hearing the Philistine's words, Saul and all the Israelites were dismayed and terrified. You know, right here the Bible records that Israel is at war with the Philistines. The time is roughly around 1063 B.C. And the Bible records that Israel came out and lined up for battle on one hill, and the Philistines lined up for battle on another hill. And in between the both armies was this giant valley. And at this time, they practiced what we call champion warfare, where each army would select their best warrior, and he would go out and he would represent the entire army for the battle. And so when that warrior fought against the other army's best warrior, whoever won, would be the winner of that war, thus not so many people would have to die. And so right here, the Philistines select their champion warrior, Goliath. And the Bible records right here that he was over nine feet tall. Now, I, I don't think some of us understand how tall this is. For me, I'm 6'4", and some would say that I'm pretty tall. Shaquille O'Neal, which I think most of us are familiar with, is seven foot one inch tall. The tallest guy currently in the world is eight feet three inches. The tallest guy recorded in the last hundred years is eight foot eleven inches. And yet Goliath was taller than all of them. And so here comes this nine foot tall guy, this, this giant of a guy. And he comes out, and the Bible says, day after day, morning and evening, for 40 days, he taunted the people. Of Israel. You know, well, what was he shouting? Well, in verse 8, he says, Why do you come out and line up for battle? Or as I like to say it, what are you guys getting all dressed up for? <laughs> you know, it's funny, one of my favorite movies of all time is the movie Braveheart. Yeah, and uh, you know, there's that one epic battle where they line up, and then, you know, the army of Scotland is about to leave, and then all of a sudden, William Wallace comes riding up. Their faces are all painted blue. They got all their war stuff ready to go. I mean, they're ready for battle. And so he gives one of the most awesome speeches of all times in all movies I've ever seen. And then after they get done getting the guys all riled up, it's time to ride out and discuss the terms of the battle. And so you got the, the nobles of Scotland going to meet the nobles of England. And so they go ride towards the middle. And then all of a sudden, William Wallace looks at his guys and goes, okay, guys, I'll be back in a little bit. They go, well, where are you going? He goes, well, I'm going to pick a fight. And so he starts riding off, and then Amish looks back at the other guy and goes, well, we didn't get dressed up for nothing. <laughs> you know, when you get your battle stuff on, 
You're ready for war. And yet right here, the people are showing up day after day after day. They were coming for battle. And yet they weren't even willing to fight. In verse 20, you take it a little bit further right here. It says, early in the morning, David left the flock and the shepherd loaded up and set out as Jesse had directed. He reached the camp as the army was going out to its battle positions, shouting the war cry. Here they are, all dressed up with no heart to fight. They were even shouting the war cry. Yeah, we're really going to get out there. We're really going to do it. We're going to take them on. And then as soon as they saw Goliath, the Bible says that they were dismayed and terrified. You know, uh, this past weekend has been very interesting. If you've kind of made your way around San Diego, you, you've probably seen a lot of people dress up. Oh, yeah. And that's because uh, every year we have what we call Comic Con. And all these, uh, uh, for lack of a better word, interesting people come in from all over the world. <laughs> And they come to this gigantic celebration of comic books. And it's very interesting because, you know, even wandering the halls in the, in the hotel here, I, I noticed a few people in costume. And at the end of the day, I mean, this is an amazing event. It sold out this year in 72 minutes. 72 minutes. And people flocked to Comic-Con. But, you know, you can dress up like a superhero all you want. It doesn't make you a superhero. Despite what some of these people might think. And, you know, sometimes I think as disciples... We, we know what we're supposed to look like. We, we can put on a nice show, and we can do a good job pretending that we're spiritual, that we're in the battle. But at the end of the day, it doesn't matter what you look like. You're either fighting the fight or you're not. And I've got to ask you, have you been in the fight, or have you just been dressing up for the battle? Let's read on right here in verse 11. The Bible says, On hearing this, the Philistines' words, Saul and all the Israelites were dismayed and terrified. You know, there are two things that will take you out of the battle spiritually. It's when you're dismayed or when you're terrified. Mm. To be terrified is to lack courage, and to be dismayed means that you've lost your courage. Either way, you're lacking courage. I think for me, one of the most inspirational men that has ever existed is Nelson Mandela. And, uh, you know, it's kind of been on my mind because it was his birthday uh, the week before this past weekend. And uh, I was just thinking about some of the quotes that he had, and I, I appreciate him in, in his example. I mean, he's kind of lived an immoral life to some degree, but he fought against the apartheid in South Africa. And uh, he's quoted saying, courage is not the absence of fear, but the triumph over fear. Sometimes I think when we avoid fear, we think we're being courageous. But, but being courageous is not avoiding fear. It's going in spite of how you fear. Yeah. And so without fear, you cannot be, by definition, courageous. Courageous implies that there's fear there. It exists, but you choose to go in spite of your fear. In Joshua chapter 1 and verse 9, God commands Joshua to be strong and courageous. Therefore, it's not a feeling, but a choice. And you can choose to be courageous when you feel fear. The only reason God gives to Joshua to be strong and courageous is because I am with you, or because God is with us. In 2 Chronicles chapter 32 and verse 7, Hezekiah commands the people to be, quote, unquote, strong and courageous. And his reason is the one that is with us is greater than he who is against us. Courage is a choice predicated on the fact that God is stronger than your opposition. Yeah. Acts 4.13. The thing that identified Peter and John as being disciples of Jesus was not their personality. It wasn't all their knowledge and all their teaching and training, their philosophies, their theology. It was their courage. And when they stood up for the truth, people go, wow, these guys have been with Jesus. Let me ask you, are you living a courageous lifestyle? Yes, you're putting yourself in positions of fear, but you're not allowing the fear to take you up. You're choosing to go in spite of how you feel. You know, one of the guys I really want to lift up is our, our brother Andy. It's so cool. I mean, Andy, of course, has been with the church here since the very beginning. And, uh, you know, brother is awesome. He speaks like four or five different languages. Uh, but, but his roots are he's from China. And uh, this past uh, Wednesday, we, we got done with our men's night out. And uh, I just happened to be looking at my phone after men's night out, and I had an email come in. And it was an email asking for all the church leaders to gather all Chinese disciples together because they're trying to formulate the Hong Kong mission team. Wow. And uh, it, had, it had a list of all the Chinese people in the movement. <laughs> Needless to say, there's not a whole lot. And so I was reading down the list, and I was going, I wonder if Andy's on the list. And so I was going down and going down and going down. Sure enough, there it was. Andy Go from San Diego. And so I was looking at this uh, on my phone, and I go, should I tell Andy? Should I not tell Andy? 
Should I show them now or should I show them later? Should I try to like just pray about it? Or I'm going to show. I said, go ahead, Andy, come here. He comes on over. I said, bro, check this out. He goes, what is it? I, I showed him the, the title or the subject of the email, and it was Gathering All Chinese Disciples. And I said, bro, guess what? He goes, what? He goes, bro, your name's on the list, right? <laughs> he goes, well, what does this mean? <laughs> I go, well, bro, for, for right now, it just means that you're invited to a meeting at the GLC, but I think beyond that, they're trying to form a Hong Kong mission team. And I go, bro, wouldn't that be awesome? And I was kind of just trying to see what he would respond or how he'd respond. He goes, yeah, that'd be awesome. <laughs> it, it took a couple seconds right there. But we talked about going back to China. And I think that there was a vision that was awakened in Andy. Now you got to understand, Andy left China. Yeah, that's his roots. That's where he grew up. But he left China, and he's kind of made himself a very comfortable life right here in the United States. It's a cost to go back to China. It, it's not easy. Yes, it's some people. Yes, he's got a heart for the people there. But it's a challenge. And I appreciate his heart because he understands. He goes, hey, I'm Chinese. I'm a Chinese disciple. They need Chinese disciples to go to China. Hey, why not me? But you've got to ask yourself, have you been dismayed or terrified? Have you lost courage or have you lacked courage? Or are you courageous in spite of how you feel? What would you get dressed up for? Are you just acting, putting on a show as a disciple? Or are you really what you say you are, willing to do anything, to go anywhere, and to give up everything? Because that's what a disciple's all about. Point two, what are you looking at? First Samuel 17, verse 12. The Bible goes on right here. It says, now David was the son of the Ephrathite named Jesse, who was from Bethlehem in Judah. Jesse had eight sons. In Saul's time, he was old and well advanced in years. Jesse's three oldest sons had followed Saul to war. The firstborn was Eliab, the second, Abinadab, and the third, Shammah. David was the youngest. The three oldest followed Saul. But when David, when David went back and forth from Saul to tend his father's sheep at Bethlehem. You know, right here, we find that the Bible mentions this guy, Jesse. And Jesse has eight sons, and the three of his oldest sons are serving Saul in battle. While the youngest son, David, was just kind of going back and forth from the battle to tending his father's sheep. In service to Saul. You go, well, now how did, how did David run across Saul? Well, well, let's go back to chapter 16, verse 1. The Bible says, The Lord said to Samuel, How long will you have to mourn for Saul since I have rejected him as king over Israel? Fill your horn with oil and be on your way. I'm sending you to Jesse of Bethlehem. I have chosen one of his sons to be king. So right here, Saul has disobeyed God. And because of his lack of repentance, God has selected another leader to take over for Saul, although Saul doesn't really know yet. So skip ahead right here to verse 4. Samuel did what the Lord said. When he arrived at Bethlehem, the elders of the town trembled when they met him. They asked, do you come in peace? Samuel replied, yes, in peace. I have come to sacrifice the Lord. Consecrate yourselves and come to the sacrifice with me. Then he consent, consecrated Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice. When he arrived, Samuel saw Eliab and thought, surely the Lord's anointed stands here before the Lord. But the Lord said to Samuel, do not consider his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. The Lord does not look at the, man, the things that man looks at. Man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Then Jesse called up Abinadab and had him pass in front of Samuel. And Samuel said, the Lord has not chosen this one either. Jesse then had Shammah pass by, but Samuel said, nor has the Lord chosen this one. Jesse had seven of his sons pass by Samuel, but Samuel said to him, the Lord has not chosen these. So he asked Jesse, are these all the sons you have? Well, there's still the youngest, Jesse answered, but he's tending the sheep. Samuel said, send for him. We will not sit down until he arrives. So he sent and had him brought in. He was ruddy with fine appearance and handsome features. Then the Lord said, rise and anoint him. He is the one. So Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the presence of the brothers. And from that day on, the spirit of the Lord came upon David in power. Samuel then went to Ramah. You know, right here, Samuel goes to elect or to anoint the next king of Israel. And God predicts or prophecies that it's going to be one of Jesse's sons. And so he goes to the house of Jesse, and he just goes, he goes, man, you've got some cranking sons right here. And he goes, that, that, that oldest guy, there's something special about him. He's got to be the one. I mean, just look how this guy looks. This guy's cranky. And God goes, no, 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 that, that's not the one. Don't look at their outward appearance, because man looks at the outward appearance. But God, me, I look at the heart. And so he goes to the next son, and then the next son, and then the next son, and so on and so forth, until he goes through all seven of Jesse's sons, except for David. And he goes, you know, I just, 
there's got to be one more son because none of these guys are God's anointed one. And Jesse goes, well, there's one more, but you don't want that guy. He's the one that's off tending the sheep. He's a young, little scrawny type kid. That, that's probably not going to be your king. He goes, that's the guy. Bring him. And so they bring David on in. He anoints David right there. And now David is anointed by God to be the next king of Israel. Why does God choose David? Well, in Acts chapter 13, verse 22, the Bible says that David was a man after God's own heart. Well, let's read on to verse 13. So Samuel took the horn of oil, anointed him in the presence of his brothers, and from that day the Spirit of the Lord came upon David in power. Samuel then went to Ramah. Now the Spirit of the Lord had departed from Saul, and an evil spirit from the Lord tormented him. Now we just looked at how with God's presence comes courage. When God's presence disappears, so does one's courage. And so right here, David has the Spirit of God. And so the Spirit comes upon David in power, but because Saul rejected God, the Spirit has now left Saul, and instead of God's spirit, he now has a tormenting spirit. Now, I think for us, we kind of come up with all kinds of terms to classify this tormenting spirit. Some of us call that stress, or sometimes we call that depression or discouragement. But the bottom line is when someone's not living the righteous lifestyle, a tormenting spirit from God will come upon you. Call it what you will. Verse 15. Saul's attendant said to him, See, an evil spirit from the Lord is, of God is tormenting. Let our Lord command his servants here to search for someone who can play the harp. He will play when the evil spirit from God comes upon you, and you will feel better. So Saul sent his attendants, find someone who plays well and bring him to me. One of the servants answered, I have seen the son of Jesse of Bethlehem who knows how to play the harp. He is a brave man and a warrior. He speaks well and is a fine-looking man, and the Lord is with him. Then Saul sent messengers to Jesse and said, send me your son David who is with the sheep. So Jesse took a donkey, loaded it with bread, of skin of wine and young goat, and sent them with his son David to Saul. David came to Saul and entered his service. Saul liked them very much, and David became one of his armor bearers. Then Saul sent word to Jesse, saying, Allow David to remain in my service, for I am pleased with him. Whenever the Spirit from God came upon Saul, David would take his harp and play. Then relief would come to Saul. He would feel better, and the evil spirit from God would leave him. This is amazing right here. Without Saul knowing that David has been anointed by God to take his place, God orchestrates Saul's life so that he desires to get somebody to help him out with his emotional battles. <laughs> and so he's advised to find somebody to play music. And so he goes and gets David, this harp player, to come. And so David would come and play the harp, and it would make him feel better. But it was only a temporary solution because at the end of the day, Saul was not repentant. And so David was in Saul's service before Saul ever came across Goliath. And so now we understand why those two are connected. You with me right here, guys? Well, I think one of the things and one of the marks of someone who has a heart after God is that they see things the way God sees things. And so I want to show you the difference of David's perspective versus Saul's perspective, understanding that the Spirit of God is now with David but has departed from Saul. So let's go back to 1 Samuel 17, verse 5, or 25. Here we've got Goliath coming out. He's calling out all the Israelites to battle. The Israelites are dismayed and terrified. Saul himself is dismayed and terrified. And David comes to bring his brothers some supplies as they're on the battle lines. And so verse 25. Now the Israelites had been saying, Do you see how this man keeps coming out? He comes out to defy Israel. The king will give great wealth to a man who kills him. He will also give him his daughter in marriage and will exempt his father's family from taxes in Israel. Now that's pretty cranking right there. Verse 26. David asked the man standing near him, What will be done for the man who kills this Philistine and removes this disgrace from Israel? Who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? Verse 32. David said to Saul, let no one lose heart on account of this Philistine. Your servant will go and fight him. You know, for David, he didn't see this as a battle between Goliath and man. He saw this as a battle between Goliath and God. He goes, man, who is this uncircumcised Philistine? At this point, circumcision was a sign of your covenant that you had a relationship with God. And so he didn't see that Goliath was this nine-foot God. He didn't see that Goliath was a giant. He was a battle. He was a warrior. He saw that this was a man who defied God, and that's all that mattered. And so here he comes, and he goes, hey, you're looking for a God to take this guy out. I'll do it. I'm your guy. We go, well, what about Saul? How did Saul see things? Well, let's look at what he says. Verse 33. Saul replied, you are not able to go out against this Philistine and fight him. You are only a boy, and he has been a fighting man since his youth. 
Saul saw things as man versus man. And Goliath is a better, stronger man. So therefore, Goliath is going to win the battle. It's very interesting. But if anyone should have been the one to take on Goliath, it should have been Saul. In 1 Samuel 9, 2, the Bible says that Saul was an impressive man without equal among the Israelites. In fact, he was a head taller than anyone in Israel. He should have been the one. But in his mind, he didn't see God in the picture. He became so man-focused that he didn't have the courage to fight the giant. And so here he is. He lets this young little boy, David, come and volunteer himself to take out Goliath. You know, I, I think that a lot of times we struggle with this concept. Because we live in this world and because we're of this world, and though we're, we're trying not to be like the world, we, we still live in a worldly place. And because we don't see God, visually speaking, a lot of times I think we can get our focus on people and not enough on God. And so, well, how do I know if I've been man-focused or not? Well, lucky for you, I put together the 10, or 10 top reasons or 10 top ways that you can know you're man-focused. Let's just put this to the test right here. Number 10. Top 10 sign that you're man-focused and not focused enough on God. Number one is you don't confess your sin. Because you're worried about what people think and not what God thinks. Number nine. You only serve the church or people when you know other people are going to see you do it. Number eight. You think, man, I, I wish we had more talented people in the church because they're the solution. No, they got a little quiet right there. Verse number seven. If you think that a quote-unquote bigger church is a quote-unquote better church because you think that strength is in numbers. Number six, when things are bad, you start to get critical towards people instead of towards God and working things out with them. Number five, you hold back from telling people the truth because you're scared you're going to lose the relationship. That, that means you're too man-focused. Number four, when you're bitter. <laughs> When you're bitter, you're just man-focused. That's the problem. Because the Bible says that you have to endure hardship as discipline from God. And so when you can see things the right way and take things as discipline from God and that God loves us, it allows us not to be bitter. Number three, people have to motivate you to obey rather than you seeking your motivation from the Lord. Number two, you don't sing at church because you're worried about what other people think. And number one reason you know you're too man-focused is if you're more fearful than you are faithful. Because your belief is not that God is with you and that God has the power to deliver you from the battle. You go, well, how did David get his perspectives to be focused on God and not on man? Well, let's look at verse 34. But David said to Saul, Your servant has been keeping his father's sheep. When a lion or a bear came and carried off his sheep from the flock, I went after it, struck it, and rescued the sheep from its mouth. When it turned on me, I seized it by its hair, struck it, and killed it. Your servant has killed both the lion and the bear. This uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them, because he has defied the armies of the living God. The Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear will deliver me from the hand of the Philistines. Saul said to David, go, and the Lord be with you. <laughs> wow. The Bible records right here that David, he went through challenges. When he was watching the sheep, a lion came to attack the sheep, and so David did what any one of us would do, and he just killed the lion. That's what we would do, right? I mean, none of us would ditch the sheep right there. And then a bear came, and he goes, well, I killed the lion, so I guess I'll take on the bear right here. And so he just took out the bear. I mean, that's, that's the most logical thing to do right there in that situation. And so when Goliath came, he goes, well, I'm, I've already killed the lion. I've already killed the bear. I guess Goliath will just be like one of these guys. Yeah, yeah. And so it makes complete and logical sense that I go and take out the giant. You know, God conditioned David to have the right perspectives and to believe in the power of God through sending a challenge of a lion, through sending the challenge of a bear. And when David conquered the lion and conquered the bear, he knew that he could take on the Goliath. You know, very often I think God puts bear situations or lion situations in your life to prepare you for the Goliath that's to come. This past week, uh, I got a chance to go share on, on campus with uh, Mallory and Tyrone. And it's kind of funny. I mean, we had a great time sharing. Uh, we met some awesome people, uh, very open people, great hearts. 
And uh, as we were sharing, um, Matt and Tyrone are, are both from Orange County, and so they were sharing their experiences sharing on Cal State Fullerton. And both of them said the same thing. Go, you know, sharing at Cal State Fullerton is much different than sharing at San Diego State. People are so much more open in Cal State Fullerton. People are so closed off here. And I was sitting there, and I was going, huh, maybe that's true. Or I don't really know. I mean, I've never been up to Cal State Fullerton, so I don't, it's hard to compare people like that. But my response was very similar. I said, well, that just means that you guys are getting some really good training right now. Because if you can share here, and this is a pretty hard campus, that means you can share anywhere. You know, so often I think that the, our problem is we view our current challenges as our Goliaths and not as our lion or our bear. Right. Yeah. And we understand as disciples that God has great plans. And our, our greatest glory is not behind us but ahead of us. And as disciples, as we constantly grow and as we're constantly changing and getting closer to God, God will use us to do more incredible things. Amen. And so the things and the challenges that you're going through right now, they're not your Goliaths. They're just your lions and your bears. But God is using those things to prepare you Amen. for the Goliath to come. But how do you respond with the lion and the bear? Is this your opportunity for you to just take it and go for it, believing that God is with you? Or do you shrink back thinking this is just too much, focusing yourself on men and not on God? Amen. I'm going to ask you, what are you looking at? What are you looking at? Are you looking at God? Or are you looking at people and see things only from a manly point of view? Our last point is that everything you got. 1 Samuel 17, verse 38. The Bible says, Then Saul dressed David in his own tunic. He put a coat of armor on him and a bronze helmet on his head. David fastened his sword over the tunic and tried walking around because he was not used to them. I cannot go in these, he said to Saul, because I'm not used to them. So he took them off. Then he took his staff in his hand, chose five smooth stones from the stream, and put them in a pouch of a shepherd's bag, and with his sling in his hand, approached the Philistine. Meanwhile, the Philistine with his shield bearer in front of him kept coming closer to David. He looked David over and saw that he was only a boy, ruddy and handsome, and he despised him. He said to David, am I a dog that you come at me with sticks? The Philistine cursed David by his gods. Come here, he said, and I'll give your flesh to the birds of the air and the beasts of the field. Or in layman's terms, is that everything you've got? Is this it? You're sending this young little boy, David, to fight against me? Now I think it's kind of humorous right here. David, understanding that he's going to go against Goliath, he, he goes to get fitted for armor, and Saul offers up his own armor. But you got to remember, Saul's a head taller than all the other people in Israel. So here's David swimming in Saul's armor. He's just like, bro, I can't do this. I mean, this is too much. Just, just send me out. I'll just get five stones, and that's all I need. Some had the audacity to say that David didn't really have that much faith because he took five stones. He should have just chose one. But actually, most scholars, if you studied out, you'll find that Goliath had four brothers. And so most scholars believe that David chose five stones because he got one for Goliath, and just in case his brothers jumped in the battle, he got four more. That's pretty cranky. But here he is. He doesn't choose any armor. He just goes and chooses five smooth stones, and he starts coming at Goliath. And the Bible records that Goliath despised him. He goes, am I a dog that you'd come at me with sticks? Is that everything you got? Is this the weapon that you've chosen to battle against me? Well, let's look at Goliath's armor. Chapter 17, verse 4. It says he was over nine feet tall. He had a bronze helmet on his head and wore a coat of scale armor of bronze weighing 5,000 shekels. Well, 5,000 shekels in our measurement is 125 pounds. That was just his armor of bronze. It goes on right here. It says on his legs he wore bronze greaves. Those are kind of like shin guards back in the day. Yeah. And a bronze javelin was slung on his back. His spear shaft, so the tip on the javelin, was like a weaver's rod. And his iron point weighed 600 shekels, 15 pounds. That's just the tip of his spear right there. And then he had his shield, which he didn't even carry. His shield bearer carried for him. So this was Goliath's armor. And here's David, little boy, no armor, five stones. And it's very interesting because most likely the helmet that Goliath wore was a helmet that covered most of his faith except for just a small little area right there. And so David, picking up five stones, knows that he's got to hit that very fine point right in between Saul's ar or, uh, Goliath's armor right there. You go, well, well wow. David didn't have any armor? Well, actually, I think that he did have armor. Go back to Ephesians chapter 6. The only thing is that David's armor really wasn't something that you could see physically. Verse 12. 
Paul says to the church in Ephesus, he says, For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God, that when you, the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground, and after you have done everything to stand, stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith in which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, and pray in the spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the saints. David didn't have physical armor, but I dare say he was wearing the armor of God, the belt of truth. That holds everything together. The breastplate of righteousness. Having a righteous lifestyle that guards your heart and your vital organs. The feet fitted with the readiness of the gospel of peace. You know what happens when you're ready? You're ready. You're ready to go. There's nothing holding you back. And yet the Bible says that you can only be ready when you are at peace with God. The shield of faith. That protects us and guards us from the flaming arrows the Bible says come from the evil one. The helmet of salvation that protects our mind. Remembering what this is all about. That we're fighting to inherit a spiritual dwelling in eternal heaven. And then the sword of the spirit. Which the Bible equates to the word of God. that's, That's what we fight with as disciples. Well let's see what happens in this epic battle. Between this young boy and this Goliath. 1 Samuel 17, verse 45. Come on, Dad. David said to the Philistine, You come against me with sword and spear and javelin, but I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you've defied. This day the Lord will hand you over to me, and I'll strike you down and cut off your head. Today I will give the carcasses of the Philistine army to the birds of the air and the beasts of the earth. And everyone in the world will know that there is a God in Israel. All those gathered here will know that it is not by sword or spear that the Lord saves, but the battle is the Lord's, and he will give all of you into our hands. As the Philistine moved closer to attack him, David ran quickly toward the battle line to meet him. That, that's where that song, Run to the Fight, comes from. Reaching into his bag, taking out a stone, he slung it and struck the Philistine on the forehead, and that little slit in between his helmet. The stone sank into his forehead, forehead and he fell face down on the ground. So David triumphed over the Philistine with a sling and a stone. Without a sword in his hand, he struck down the Philistine and killed him. David ran and stood over him. He took hold of the Philistine's sword and drew it from the scabbard. After he killed him, he cut off his head with the sword. When the Philistines saw that their hero was dead, they turned and ran. Then the men of Israel and Judah surged forward with a shout and pursued the Philistines to the entrance of Gath and the gates of Ekron. Their dead were strewn along the Sarah road of Gath and Ekron. When the Israelites returned from chasing the Philistines, they plundered the camp. David took the Philistines' head and brought it to Jerusalem, and he put the Philistines' weapons in his own tent. What a victory. David and Goliath. The Bible says that Goliath comes at him with all his armor, with his shield bearer standing out there. And as he's getting ready, he starts approaching David, and David just takes a stone just Slings it right in Goliath's forehead. Some have asked, why was Goliath so surprised when David hit him with a stone? Well, because that thought never entered his head before. (laughs) (laughs) That, That stone came, it sank in his forehead, and the Goliath just falls right down. And David just walks over, grabs that giant sword, stands over Goliath, Now, giants' heads don't come off that easy. I I imagine they probably took a few swacks. And he took the head, takes his weapons, and carries them to his own tent. I don't don't know what he did with them after that. I mean, maybe he just kind of kept it right there on his dresser drawer, you know, like that. But in verse 46, I think we find something pretty inspiring. In killing Goliath, David understood. He says, and the whole world will know that there is a God in Israel. This one act of courage. You know, here in the church, we believe in evangelizing the world. That is our mission from God. 
that God has given us a purpose. That as long as we live here on this earth, our job is to go and spread the gospel. And since we only have one generation, because we don't get to live beyond our generation, our charge is to evangelize the world in our generation. That, that's our charge. And yet right here, David accomplishes world evangelism in one single day with one single act of courage. With the armor of God. You know, it's really cool on Friday night, the campus ministry got to go watch a, a basketball game because uh, one of the sisters in our church in Houston was out here for the weekend, and uh, she used to play in the WNBA, and she was invited to play in this basketball game, and none of us really know what it was about. And so we get to the basketball game to encourage our sister, and it turns out it was a game by the Harlem Globetrotters, and she was yeah. playing on the team. Yeah. Now, if you guys have ever seen the Harlem Globetrotters, it's basically like a basketball game slash comedy act. And it was awesome because I remember seeing the Globetrotters when I was like four years old. And uh, we went to a basketball gym in Hawaii, and there they were. And I even remember some of the same guys that were on the team and same of the, some of the same acts that they were doing. Yeah, it was so cool because w- when they announced the Globetrotters, they announced the, the main guys, the actual comedy act guys, as guys who have been around the whole world, who performed before presidents and before kings and before monarchs and things like that. And then they were right there. And I was just thinking about that. I was going, well, this is so amazing. These jokesters, they're pretty funny. But they're just jokesters. They've evangelized the world. They've been all around the world. And everywhere you go, people know of Harlem Globetrotters. If those guys can do it, why can't we do it with God? Why can't we do it? I mean, think about all the people who are known around the world, who are absent the power of God. And yet here we are as disciples with the most important message the world has ever heard. And we, too, as long as we have courage with the armor of God, can evangelize the world. Amen. You know, I don't know about you guys, but I'm really fired up to be at the GLC in a couple weeks. Yeah. I, I love going to these conferences. And uh, this year, I'm particularly excited because it's different than all the other global leadership conferences. And uh, the schedule, instead of dividing it up, they, they used to divide it up, uh, those that aspire to be in some form of leadership or responsibility, uh, some who are in leadership responsibilities, and then some who are leading churches. And so it's those three categories. Well, this year they decided to do away with those three categories, and they decided to divide up all the classes based on world sectors. And so those that desire to go to Asia will go to one area. Those that desire to serve in Europe will go to another area. Those that desire to serve in Australia go to another area, Africa, another area, and so on and so forth. And you know what's awesome? Guess what one area is not going to be in the schedule or in the program? The United States. Isn't that awesome? Because you know what will happen if they put a, a, on the program that you can go to the United States class? All the United States disciples will go to the United States class. Why? Because it's comfortable in the United States. And I really appreciate the fact that we're in some ways forced to get a vision for the world. Because that's what we signed up for. As disciples, we decided that we were going to sell ourselves out. That we were going to give ourselves fully to the work of the Lord. That we are going to make Jesus our Lord. And no matter where we go, we're going to preach the word until we multiply disciples that take over the world. And so today, I just got to ask you, what did you get dressed up for? Are you really in the battle? Or are you just putting on the nice face and the war paint and pretending really well? What are you looking at? Are you God-focused or are you focused on men? And is that everything you got? Have you got on the armor of God, ready for the battle? You know, whether or not we will be victorious in evangelizing the world will depend on how you answer these giant questions. And brothers and sisters, giant questions deserve giant answers. Thank you, guys. God bless you all. (laughs)